25th day of June 2018, allegedly according to that thing we call a calendar. And this indeed is the Ocelli Effect, broadcasting live from the facilities of Ocelli.com, also heard on a variety of affiliate networks whom we do appreciate. Anyway, this is a moon day or Monday according to your calendar. And uh, quite honestly, that is uh, the beginning of the week of broadcasts here. But tonight we're going to begin something else. And uh, this is something that we discussed briefly, myself and Jordan Maxwell, last week. Uh, I think a little bit on air, but then a lot more off air uh, regarding what was going to start to happen, a series. And uh, this is something that is out of the ordinary. It is not part of the standard set, although for the next couple of Mondays, Jordan Maxwell will be with me. So I'm going to dispense with my normal standard introductions. Do appreciate you guys for tuning in, even if you are catching this further on down the stream via your Flandel Slab of Choice, your applicable application through your podcatcher du jour. You are equally welcome here. And the information tonight, this is what I have to say about it. The world around us is designed to be deceptive. Okay? Many live in fear and perish for lack of knowledge. Doesn't that sound familiar? Facts are facts. Truth is reality untamed, quite honestly. To educate about truth is an act of love in this humble speaker's opinion. Tonight is the first of a special series uh, present, uh, uh, presentations, excuse me. We plan to continue each Monday for an unspecified amount of episodes with Jordan Maxwell, unmasking what is commonly called religion. So it is, uh, quite literally just with love in my own heart that I step back and present Jordan Maxwell to discuss this particular issue. Jordan. Yes, sir, and thank you very much, uh, Chuck, for allowing me to be on the show. And, um, yeah, the subject is such an enormous subject. Uh, takes in all of human history uh, that it's, you know, we've discussed the fact you and I have that it would re- really need to be discussed over a period of, <clears throat> of weeks because I'd like to just talk about the general subject of religion and point out all of the many, many hidden potholes and rocks under the water that you'll not see in religion. And so much of, uh, of what we call the religious world today is absolutely, uh, it's, it's an incredible story of how much people are not being told about their religious belief systems and where they where these ideas have come from, etc. So I've always felt it would be a great idea to just look at the whole subject of religion, no matter which one. There's so many of them. We will, of course, concentrate on the on the big three: uh, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. But uh, very few people have ever asked themselves, why do we have the big three? Why is there always a big three, the three major religions? And in the three major religions, you have the god of the three major religions is always a triune god. He's uh, always divided into three persons, the one god. <clears throat> and uh, But, you know, three plays a big important uh, issue and the secret societies that started our different religions. Most most people don't know that our religions came from secret groups and secret societies in history that have come up with an idea and promoted it. They had the opportunity to promote it because they had the money and they owned the means of communication, so they promoted it around town and it grew and grew until finally today we have all the big religions of the world today, never realizing that uh, just about all of the major religions in the world today are the work of secret societies and fraternal orders that you don't even know about, you've never heard of before. So I just, have, I just felt that it would be interesting just to look at religion. Because there's so much in religion that people have taken for granted, which is not true. 
I mean, I'll give you a little small classic example. I mean, uh, you you see the Statue of Liberty on Liberty Island in New York. First of all, there's a lot of indication that the Statue of Liberty is not a woman. It's a man. Most people don't know that. It's a man, not a woman. And it's not the Statue of Freedom. It's the Statue of Liberty. This is why it's on an island in the water, because liberty is a term in international monetary term that means, uh, you know, this is what a sailor gets when he pulls into port on the ship in the, uh, in the Navy. You ask permission to go up, you know, to go on land. So if the captain gives you permission, and he may not, but if he gives you permission to go on land, then you have uh, liberty. So you are at liberty to go wherever you want. But, uh, you know, he didn't say you were free. You just don't walk off the ship when you get ready. No. You ask permission. So that's why these, it's called the Statue of Liberty, not freedom. So in America, you're not free. You ask permission. You get a license. You pay the fine. You pay the ticket. You uh, ask the government for permission to do whatever. Virtually everything you do, you must get a permit from the government, a license. You pay a fee to be able to do something. So that's what the Statue of Liberty has given to America. You just ask permission. There is no freedom in America. Never has been. So um, there may have been a little bit of that taste of freedom at the very beginning, but it was quickly rubbed out in America you know, because the people who run this world were not about to have uh, people on the earth who could dance around and call themselves free. Europe was anything but free. And so the people who ran Europe, remember the people who ran Europe uh, ran the world. And so they weren't, they're not interested in hearing some of the little smaller colonies that they owned and financed and organized and directed around the world under the British Empire were all of a sudden deciding they were going to be free. And they didn't need to, to ask the uh, British government for anything. They were going to be free people. Well, that didn't last very long. Nobody's going to be free, period. And so, uh, <clears throat> and so, one of the things which has been used to uh, manipulate the populations and the peoples of this world is religion, of course. And so, I just thought it'd be interesting to look at some of the uh, interesting facts about religion that we're not aware of. Let's start with with the three major religions, as I said: Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. I, for one, myself, this is just my idea, my, my, my idea based on the past uh, 58 years, 59 years now of looking at theology. My conclusion is, is that Christianity was the first religion. Judaism did not precede Christianity. Christianity preceded Judaism. Judaism was dreamt up as a religion in the A.D. There was no uh, B.C. religion of Judaism or ancient Israel or the ancient uh, religion of the Jews going back to ancient Israel. My feeling is, based on what I've seen in the past close to 60 years, is there was no ancient Israel, period. There was no such a problem and no, no such a state as Israel. It never existed. It's a, nothing but a theology that was dreamt up during probably the early uh, Middle Ages. I would say probably about the 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th century uh, <clears throat> A.D. Uh, was being developed in Europe the concept or the idea that there was an ancient Israel and that ancient Israel taught this and ancient Israel taught that. But when you begin to really do some homework on it, you'll find out there was no ancient Israel. It never existed. So the whole thing was just a story. And 
So that's what I hope to be able to help people to learn, is that uh, there was no ancient Israel, period. So don't look back to the ancient prophets and the ancient uh, or, uh, the ancient writings, because all of those ancient so-called writings of the ancient Hebrews <clears throat> were actually Knights Templar Masonic documents, probably dreamt up during the 8th, 9th, 10th, and 11th century A.D., in Europe by the Masonic orders coming out of the Roman Catholic Church, Knights Templars, and also then added to once you had the uh, the Crusades when the Pope Innocent sent the the uh, the Catholic uh, Knights of Malta and the Masonic Order of Knights into the Middle East to um, to get rid of the Islamic influence. And when those when those uh, Christian knights came back after the Crusade, they uh, they had learned a lot while they were in the Middle East. They learned the alcohol, the drinks. The they they learned the customs of the people. They learned uh, from the assassins how to kill. They learned all kinds of interesting concepts and ideas coming out of that ancient culture in uh, in the Middle East. <clears throat> and so they brought those ideas back into the Catholic Church. They brought those ideas back into the fraternal orders uh, of the Masonic orders in Europe today. And so a lot of people don't know that uh, that the, a lot of the teachings in Judaism and Christianity actually comes from the Knights Templars. The Masonic order inside the Catholic Church that dominated Europe. And of course you'll have to remember that you know, Rome as a as a dictatorial power. Rome has dominated the earth for I don't know twenty three hundred years. <clears throat> First of all, with the with the coming of the Republic of Rome, and then eventually under the Caesars of Rome, has dominated all of Europe. And then, of course, with the fall of Rome about the fifth century A.D. The fall of Rome, uh, you now have today the papacy, the Holy Father. The Pope is even referred to as the Pontifex Maximus, which was a term that was given to Caesar when Caesar ruled Rome. So we still have the Roman Caesar today, where all the peoples of the world, no matter who they are, no matter what their religion, what color they are, They all come to Rome and bow down on their knees and kiss the ring of the God Father uh, because he represents God, the Pope, and he is uh, the Holy Father. So he's the God Father. And so when you talk about the mob and the God Father, you need to look at the Vatican. That's where the real God Father rules from. That's why all the big-time gangsters and mafiosis in history, when they were shot down and murdered, they always had big Catholic funerals. And all the cardinals were out there, you know, officiating over the big Catholic funerals of all the criminals. And you need to also check and find out why the Pope wears the Jewish yarmulke, the little, the little cap that the Pope wears. We, we see it as a Jewish yarmulke, but he's, the Pope wears it, and all the cardinals wear the same thing. So there's something going on with uh, the Roman system. <clears throat> and so for 1,600 years under the Vatican, the Vatican has ruled Europe, period. All of Europe has been dominated by the Vatican. And for 1,600 years, the entire world of mankind, <clears throat> has been dominated by Europe. So all roads lead to Rome. Ultimately, the Holy Father, as far back as the fall of the, of the Roman Empire, the Holy Father has been the dominant uh, you know, power in Europe. And Europe has been the dominant power on the earth. So, so much for the, 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 the presence of Almighty God. And a professor of mine one time said, when you're talking about these kind of subjects, you need to define your terms. 
So when you're using words in theology, you need to define what you mean by those words. So when you hear someone talking about God, I always ask, would you define what you mean about God? Because, you know, a lot of people talk about God, but everybody has a different idea about what they're talking about. Most people have no idea what they're talking about. So... My my first my first entrance into this whole subject of religion is to look at the words and the terms and the symbols that have been used by different religions of the world and look at the beginnings of things. Go back to the very day it began. And uh, that's the way I like to do whenever I'm looking at any organization or church or philosophy. I like to see who started this idea or who started this church where did it begin who put up the money and uh, how is it that we still are worshiping the day something that was put up and started you know 1600 years ago and so in relation to uh, zionism for instance if we're talking about religion let's just let me just bring this little point in about zionism <clears throat> because if you go back to the dictionaries, the encyclopedias, and you will find that back as far back as 1820, uh, in the United States in 1820, there was a guy named Mordecai Noah. And he, with other fellow Jews, wanted to set up a Zionist homeland in America. And so they picked this, uh, the, the place of the new homeland back in 1820. They picked a Grand Island, New York. And that was where they began to proclaim that they were going to found the new Zionist home of the Jewish people in uh, Grand Island, New York. Well, <clears throat> 1820s, that didn't work out. It fell through. That was okay because now 1903, in 1903, the British colonial secretary, Joseph Chamberlain, he suggested the theor- to Zionist Theodore Herzl, the, one of the main leaders of the Zionist movement. So back in 1903, British colonial secretary Joseph Chamberlain suggested to Theodore Herzl that he should put the homeland for the Jews at the Mao Plateau in Kenya, Africa. The idea was referred to by the Zionists as the Uganda Programme. So the, it was pointed out by the by the British to the Zionists, why don't you uh, uh, take your homeland for the Jews and put it in Africa, put it in, uh, in Kenya, Africa. But after talking about it and thinking about it, the governments of Kenya and England and the rest and the Zionists, it all fell apart. They decided, no, forget it. They didn't. They didn't need the Zionist homeland in Africa after all. So it was a bad idea. So a couple of years later, in 1905, a large group of angry and frustrated European Jews, not in the Middle East, <clears throat> this was in 1905, a large group of angry and frustrated European Jews formed an organization called the Jewish Territorialist. And their organization was the aim of which was they said they wanted to be the founders of a Jewish homeland of some kind, somewhere. They needed to establish a Jewish homeland on earth. And so it was called the Jewish Territorialist Organization, 1905. And they they wanted to just find somewhere for the Jewish homeland. Well, that didn't work either. So it fell apart. <clears throat> so later on, in uh, 1928, in March of 1928, in the then Soviet Union, uh, the Soviet Union suggested that the Russian Far East would be a great place uh It was a great place for the homeland of the Jews. It was very far out, away from everybody. And so the Zionist communists, the communists said to the Zionists, why don't you put your homeland here in the Soviet Union? 
And so the new Soviet communist idea was called the Jewish Autonomous Oblast, O-B-L-A-S-T. So <clears throat> this particular idea that the Soviet Union came up with in 1928, it, like the other three, it didn't go anywhere. It fell apart and nothing happened. Then in 1930, another brilliant idea was suggested by the British Zionist League. The British Zionist League in 1930 came up with a great idea that in Australia, there's a place called the Kimberley region in Australia. <clears throat> and that would be perfect for a Jewish homeland in Australia. So large, so incredibly uh, you know, large and spacious. And it was called the Kimberley region in Australia. And so they decided that was where the new homeland was going to be, 1930 in the Kimberley region of Australia. But after thinking about it for a few, for a few months, the Australian government officials, they said, no, not in our backyard. That, that's not going to work. So that one fell apart again. Later on, shortly afterwards, the premier of Tasmania, the premier of Tasmania, Robert Cosgrove, came up with a dazzling idea. He suggested that the homeland for the Jewish people should be in Port Davey, D-A-V-E-Y, Port Davey area of southwest Tasmania. <clears throat> now, this is the premier of Tasmania, Robert Cosgrove, and he said, why don't the Jews put their homeland in, in Port Davey in southwest Tasmania? That would be a great idea. But he died shortly after, after the suggestion, and everybody, you know, everybody decided, ah, forget it, it's just a bad idea anyway. So that didn't work either. But finally, the, the, Zionist, uh, the Zionist leaders finally had the correct idea. They finally got a good idea. The Zionist Jews that were setting up the homeland for the Jewish people, God's chosen people, well, they decided this time they were going to go to the Lord. They were going to ask the Lord to help them. And so the Lord uh, you know, did help them, and their, and their homeland was set up. So it was a smart thing after trying so many times and falling through. They finally went to the Lord, and the Lord did help them set up the state of Israel. So the Zionists went to Lord Rothschild, their Lord, Lord Philippi the Rothschild. And Rothschild, the Lord of the Jewish uh, Zionists, <clears throat> he called one of his uh, prostitutes, named Lord Arthur Balfour. Everybody in England knew that Lord Arthur Balfour, one of the big politicians in England, was nothing more than a, than a uh, Rothschild uh, you know, behind kisser, butt kisser, and that's all he's ever been. And so he was appointed uh, by the British Israel, Israel Illuminati Masters of the World to be the one to go to the United Nations for Lord Rothschild and present this idea uh, to the United Nations to have the British home uh, to have the Jewish homeland uh, in the in uh, the Middle East and what we call the land of Cana. And so they went into Cana and just took it over. They didn't ask permission. They didn't ask anybody. They just went in with the British guns behind them with the American military and government behind them, with the international Rothschild money and banking fraternities behind them, the Zionists went into the Middle East and just decided, we're going to take over a piece of land in the Middle East, and we're going to call it the land of Israel, and we'll say that God gave us this land, and anybody who don't like it will kill them, period. So we're tired of asking permission. And so that's why today we still have today the land of Israel, God's chosen people, which is nothing more than a Rothschild banking United States, British banking fraternities with their military behind the founding of the state of Israel. So 
so much for the holiness in the Middle East because I have been saying for years, and I'll say it again, there's nothing holy in the state of Israel or the Holy Land. There's nothing holy in the Holy Land. Uh, the reason why is because all the stories coming out of the Holy Land are full of holes. And so once you see that the Israel today is nothing more than a political Rothschild, United States, British Empire political move on the world stage, of which behind the scenes the Vatican and the international criminal syndicates uh, are, are behind the military movement in the Middle East. And so it's a very, very dark story about the whole, whole idea of the Lord's chosen people. There is no such a thing as the Lord's chosen people. Israel was not a B.C. religion. The entire state of Israel today was started by the British Americans going through the United Nations and providing the money and the military backing to go in and just take the property and say, God gave us this property, so get out of here. We're taking it over. <clears throat> so much for God's chosen people. <clears throat> so anyway, we move down the line, and, you know, if you ask a child today, ask a Christian child today if they believe in God, and they say yes, uh, then where you ask them, where is God? <clears throat> Where does he live? <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and so you ask the child, where is God? And they will point straight up. He's out there. He's in heaven. Well, if he's in heaven, uh, he also has angels. Do you believe in angels? Yes. Well, where do the angels live? Where are they? They're out there with God. They're out there in the universe. <clears throat> So I don't know if you know this or not, but if you are from out there, like God in the angels, then you are extraterrestrial. But if you're from Alabama or, or, or live in New York or you were born in Canada, then you are terrestrial, meaning you're from this earth. But we are to understand that God and the angels are not of this world, so that means they're out there, they're extraterrestrial. So... There's an interesting story that probably you've never heard. I talked about it maybe once or twice in, in, uh, on shows, but I think it bears repeating now. <clears throat> if you go back to a book today, which is you can still find in libraries and you can still buy it in the, in the bookstores today, <clears throat> the book is called The Theogony of Hesiod. The Theogony is T-H-E-O-G-O-N-Y, Theogony of Hesiod, which is spelled H-E-S-I-O-D. The Theogony of Hesiod is a very thick book that you can find in the libraries or order it uh, if you wish. You can still get it today. Uh, Hesiod was supposedly an illiterate herdsman living back about 700 B.C., uh, in ancient the ancient Grecian Empire under the ancient Greeks, and according to Hesiod, who was an illiterate herdsman, he was he said that in his book the Theogony, he said that one night while he was out looking over and watching over his uh, his sheep, uh, that three angels, three separate angels, were glowing. Uh, a glowing angels, they floated up to him. He said they didn't walk up to him. It was as they floated in the air up to him. And they called themselves, they referred, they told them, they told Hesiod <clears throat> that they referred to themselves as muses. M-U-S-E-S, -E muses. From which we get the word today, museum or music. Amusement, M-U-S-E, muses were the three angels that appeared to Hesiod, uh, 700 B.C. They said that they talked to, uh, Hesiod said that they talked to uh, him telepathically. And they told him, the three angels said that they wanted him to write a book 
about the gods that rule over our heavens, not the whole universe, but the gods that rule over us, we humans, in our heavens. And so he told them that he was illiterate and couldn't read or write, and they said that's that would be fine because they would uh, do something that they would call uh, channeling, and they would overshadow him, and he would just put the uh, pen to the paper, and they will write it for him. So they told him, don't worry about the fact you can't read or write. We will do the automated writing for you. And we will download for you the pecking order of the gods in your heavens. So it was a, it was a strange idea that these three angels came to Hesiod back at the ancient Grecian Empire and said to him, you know, we want to tell you about the the gods that are over this earth. And we want you to write it so other people can read it. And he said, I'm, I'm illiterate and I can't write. So they they did the writing for him. And so it was called uh, channeling. We still have the same kind of thing happening today where spirits will overshadow uh, a person and talk through them. So anyway, they said, then they went on to tell him that the God over our particular solar system in the Milky Way, the Milky Way galaxy we're part of, and I do mean a small, tiny part of, but we're part of the Milky Way galaxy. And the muses, the angels told Hesiod that in our galaxy, uh, in the galaxy, we have something called our, our solar solar system and there is a god who has been appointed to be over our solar system and he is the god over all human life and on the earth so when you hear humans talking about god the muses said that god's name is zeus z-e-u-s zeus and zeus is the god of the earth and he is the one that has created mankind and has the full dominion over the earth and all life on it. And so, later we find out uh, from the angels that Zeus lives uh, on a floating city. They call it a floating city in the universe, uh, and just outside of our solar system, that Zeus, our god, uh, lives in a floating city in the constellation, in a star constellation, of Cassiopeia. So there we have our God over the earth, according to the Theogony of Hesiod, our God is Zeus, and he lives in a floating city, and in 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 it's in a section of the star system called Cassiopeia. Very interesting. The muses went on to tell Hesiod that if Zeus were to drop an anvil from his front porch and drop it down to the earth, if Zeus were to drop an anvil, it would take nine days and nine nights and so many hours for it to hit the earth. Well, it's fairly easy to calculate that distance at which an anvil would fall. So multiply that by nine days and nine nights and so many hours. And so it was easy to calculate the distance to a little over three million miles from Earth. And so according to Hesiod and the three muses of the three angels, Zeus lives a little over three million miles from the Earth in a star system called Cassiopeia, And Zeus is our father who art in heaven because he's up there in heaven. A little over three million miles up there. And so our father who art in heaven is Zeus. And hallowed be thy name, Zeus. And of course, in the, so that's the name of that tune. So now back in 1930, there was an American astronomer named Carl Jansky, K-A-R-L Jansky, J-A-N-S-K-Y. An American astronomer named Carl Jansky, 1930, 
Carl Jansky built the first radio telescope. And he won the Nobel Prize and was called the father of modern radio telescopes. He then, Carl Jansky, also then built a radio transmitter to beam signals out into the heavens. And in the 1930s, just to see what might happen, I, I'm assuming that he had read uh, the Theogony of Hesiod, so Carl Jansky, out in the 1930s with his new radio transmitter, he transmitted a signal to Cassiopeia, just for the hell of it. Sent out a strong signal to Cassiopeia. They said it was about 14.3 mega, mega cycle. And if you can believe it, he got back an intelligent signal that was amplified, but he didn't know what it meant or who sent it. But Carl Jensky sent out a, a message to Cassiopeia, and he got back an intelligent signal. And he said it was amplified, crystal clear. But he did not know how to read it, or, or who sent it, or what it said. But it was intelligent signal. And so incidentally, when Carl Jensky died, all of his notes were immediately taken from his office by, quote, men wearing black suits, men in black. I don't know, I don't know what that tells you. <laughs> now, in the mid-1940s, a Scottish astronomer named Duncan Luan, Lunan, D-U-N-C-A-N, Duncan Lunan, L-U-N-A-N. He was working with Carl Jensky's radio telescope and transmitter. 1940s Scottish astronomer. And he too decided to send out a signal aimed at Cassiopeia just to see what would happen. And he too got back a signal about 20 seconds later, both intelligently and, uh, both intelligent and amplified. And he didn't know what to make of it either. He couldn't understand it, but it was highly intelligent and it was amplified crystal clear, intelligent answer. He just didn't know what the answer was. But Duncan Lunhan uh, narrowed the signal down to a particular light, a particular star in Cassiopeia, which today is called the Lunan object. You look it up in the dictionary, L-U-N-A-N object, the Lunan object. And, and it was a uh, the signal was coming from a particular star, a particular point of light in the Cassiopeia constellation. And that particular little piece of light, that little dot of light, we call the Lunan, what is it, the Lunan, uh, wait a minute, there's so much document here. Object. It's called the Lunan object. Okay. Now, you can go in an encyclopedia and read about the Lunan object. Now, the word for God in Greek, the ancient Greek word for God is theos, T-H-E-O-S. And so the chief theos of God, the chief God of our, in our area of the universe was called Zeus. And therefore he was God the father of all the other gods that we know. So in the ancient Greeks in prayer, it would be our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, Zeus. Zeus in the Middle East was very, very prominent as a god for many centuries. In the Middle East, they have a canal named after Zeus. It's called the Suez Canal. Suez is Zeus spelled backwards. So the Suez Canal was in honor of Zeus, the god of this world, the god of our earth. Now let's look for a moment quickly at the word father. In the ancient Sanskrit language, father is Pitar, P-I-T-A-R. Not Peter, P-E-T-E-R, no, Pitar, P-I-T-A-R. In the old Persian world, the word father is pitta also, P-I-T-A. Uh, Sanskrit was P-I-T-A-R, but in old 
the old Persian is P-I-T-A. While in the Greek and Latin, father is pater, P-A-T-E-R. Now you have pater, pater. You've probably heard that term. Well, pater and pater is the father. In Sanskrit, and Persian, and in Greek and Latin, the father is pater, P-A-T-E-R. So the ancient word for God was the pater, pater. Again, in ancient Greek, the father god named Zeus was referred to as Zeus Pater, the father god. Zeus Pater, or God the Father, in the Latin, God the Father was Zeus, but today, uh, it, it, we don't spell Zeus, Z-E-U-S, it's spelled D-E-U-S, Dios. And so Dios is God today, in Latin, Dios, no, Z-E-U-S, Zeus. And so in the ancient Rome, the god or Zeus was called I-U hyphen Peter, P-E-T-E-R, I-U and then Peter, which is Zeus in the Roman religion. I's are interchangeable with J. So Zeus or I-U hyphen Peter becomes J-U hyphen Peter, or Jupiter. So Jupiter is Iupiter. So while we're on the subject, the Greek Zeus became the Roman Jupiter. The Romans uh, took the, Jew the Greek Zeus and turned his name into Jupiter, Iupiter. And another name for Jupiter was Jove. J-O-V-E, Job. And that's in the Bible. So when you hear someone say that God is love, L-O-V-E, I've heard that for many years, and I thought, what are you talking about? That doesn't make any sense that God is love. No, it's not God is love, L-O-V-E. It's God is Job, J-O-V-E. J's and L's are interchangeable. So now we understand God is Job, Jupiter, or Zeus, Pater. So, in the ancient world, it was believed that the god Zeus protected the royalty. He was said to be the Zeus, the god over the chosen, the royalty. So Zeus the god chooses who is to be royal, and he will protect the royalty. And they were then, well, then we today say that they rule, the royalty rule, by divine right. And so today we have the kings who will tell you they ruled uh, the empires by divine right. What do you mean divine right? Well, it means that the Pope, the Roman Catholic Pope, papacy, overshadows all business and religion in the world today, period. And so if the Pope appoints you and allows you to be a prince or a king or whatever, if he allows it, then you have a divine right because he represents Zeus, Pater, or Jew, Pater. And one last thing, God in Latin is Dios, D-E-U-S. And Dios in the old Persian is diva, D-A-I-V-A, -A, which means evil or demonic god. So by a dictionary definition, that means that Christianity worldwide is worshiping an ancient demonic god. Of course, that might explain some of the history and the bloodshed and human slavery over the last thousands of years. Another small point is that Zeus ruled from Mount Olympus. And we know now that there's about 15 other holy mountains like Mount Fuji in Japan, Mount Ararat in Armenia, Mount Athros in Greece, Mount Everest in Himala Himalayans, Mount Shasta in California. So as you may have already figured out, Mount Olympus becomes the great Middle Eastern Arabic moon cult. And this is what was referred to, the moon cult was called Mount Sinai. So when you understand that the moon god in the ancient Middle East 
uh, thousands of years ago, the worshippers in the Middle East worshipped the moon. Uh, this is why today they still worship the moon in the Middle East, and uh, that's why their holy days and the Jewish holy days today are still after 6 o'clock in the evening. So Jews count their days from 6 in the evening to the next day at 6 in the evening. So from sundown to sundown is the Jewish day. While Christians are worshiping the sun, God's sun, the light of the world, of course the sun's the light of the world. So the Christians who are worshiping the sun, are they, they count their days from the sunrise to the next sunrise. Well, Jews count it from the sunset to the next sunset. Why? Because in the Middle East, there was a worship in the ancient world of the moon god. And the moon god came, he lived in the mountains. So if you were uh, on the, uh, if you were in Egypt or on the Sinai desert, uh, west of the Sinai, you look every evening and the east, look every evening in the east, and about six o'clock, the moon would come up. Uh, from the mountains, there's a high mountain range in, in Sinai. So about six o'clock, the moon would come up behind the mountains. So to the ancient people, the moon worshipers, they said the moon was their god and that he lived, obviously, he lived in the mountain. Why? Because every night, every evening at six o'clock, he finally wakes up and comes to see the world and so it's at 6 o'clock the moon god comes out. So that's why the day the Jews are still worshiping the moon god and have their holy days after sundown. And they will even tell you they have a lunar calendar. Of course they have a lunar calendar because the very word Sinai comes from the moon god's name. Go look this up in a dictionary. Go look this up in, a, in any dictionary. Look up moon god in the ancient Middle East, and his name was Sin, S-I-N. That's not a word that we use in Christianity for the falling short or, or uh, doing something bad and you, you know, and you committed a sin. No, Sin, S-I-N, was the name of the moon god in Arabia. That was his name, S-I-N. And in the ancient Arabic tongue, it goes back to the mountain of the moon god. And the mountain was A-I. And so you put the god of the mountain, Sin, in front of his home, the mountain, A-I, and it becomes Sinai. So Mount Sinai is Sin, A-I. The mountain of the moon god, Sin, who lives in the mountain, A-I. So when we hear all these wonderful stories about Mount Sinai and and the holiness of the Israel. And then you come to find out that actually, no, if you go back and do some research, you will find out that, uh, no, the God was sin. He was a moon God. And, uh, so his worshipers during the Middle East, uh, you know, would worship him after six o'clock in the evening because that's when the moon God comes out. And so there's where we get the, uh, the holiness of the, of Israel and how holy, holy days of Israel today is after six o'clock. They have holy days after six. Why? Because of the moon god's sin. That's why if you go into Egypt, if you go into Israel today, you're going to a sin of God. S-I-N. In America and England, it's S-Y-N. But in, in, in Israel, it's spelled S-I-N. Synagogue. Synagogue is a house of the worship of the god Sin, S-I-N, the moon god. So, you know, let's understand that, that the whole of Jewish, Jewish religion is based on the ancient moon god Sin and the, and the whole idea of the house of Sin was the house of Synagogue. And that uh, all of this goes back to the old ancient moon worshippers and the holy days after sundown and all that kind of thing. This just opens up a small portion of a bigger, bigger story. And so we'll have a lot of things to talk about in the future in relation to the general idea of Judaism and Christianity, 
where did they come from and what are some of the background of the teachings of both the Jews and the Christians? Where does it all come from? Now we also... Well, right, Jordan, at this point, right, because we're, we're actually coming very close to the end of the first hour, and I think this is an excellent place to actually break off a little bit early than I normally would. But I mm-hmm. think this is a, a perfect spot to stop. One thing that I do have in my mind uh, from the beginning of what you said, though, is uh, very shocking, and that is that uh, I have always been taught and always been taught to accept the idea that Judaism preceded Christianity. And uh, you have an idea that it did not. And uh, this is very interesting to me. Um, and and I, I, I do believe we'll, we'll have to get some more history on what has brought you to that idea. But right. uh, but honestly, uh, thus far, there has been a whole lot of information. And I would tell the listener, if you're not taking notes at this point, <clears throat> you may want to <laughs> go back and listen to the first hour again because... Uh, you know, the, the, the ideas and the entire structure of what is being laid out here is fully organic. I, I have said very little in this first hour because that is the design of what it is we are going to do here, uh, just for people's notification so they understand why they haven't heard from me. I didn't fall asleep. I didn't go away. I didn't leave Jordan all by himself without him <laughs> knowing what he was going to do. This yes. uh, was absolutely intentional. So we're going to take yes. this break right now, let Jordan get a drink and resettle, and also all of you to try and absorb what has already been discussed here in the first hour of the Ocelli Effect. Uh, we'll take this break for as long as Jordan wants to, so we and an we'll be abbreviated right break now. there uh, at a natural break point, as I said, during the, uh, the time when we did it. And Jordan Maxwell is with me, and he is doing the first part of a very special uh, discussion Discussion regarding religion in general. Now, we're not sure how many parts this series will have, but this is only part one. And uh, for the most part, people might notice, like I said, I have been rather silent. That will continue to be the condition here. And uh, we will take breaks at a natural point where I think uh, they need to be. And that's the way it's going to happen here. This is going to flow very organically, not very regimented, but uh, extremely well textured and layered in a lot of information, uh, some of which, quite frankly, I have never heard before. I have never uh, quite fully grasped before. I'm aware of a lot of what Jordan is talking about, but I'm sure you, the listener, are saying at certain points, yes, we know this part, but maybe we never heard that, and that is the point of it. I, I do believe that uh, this series will fill in a great many gaps in people's knowledge and also uh, shake some people out of their stupor uh, for lack of knowledge when it comes to this particular subject. So, again, with this in mind, I uh, go back to Jordan. Well, thank you very much. Uh, there is really... Uh, uh, like I said, I, I don't believe that there was a B.C. religion called Judaism. I don't think that there was anything uh, before the 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th century A.D. in Europe. Uh, the reason why I think the story uh, was put into a book, you know, because the people of all three religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, are referred to as the people of the book. All three peoples, all three religions are referred to as the people of the book. Why? Because it's all three religions are based on a book. And so if it's not the Quran, it's the Bible. If it's not the Bible, it's the, uh, what we call, the Christians call the New Testament, the Old Testament. And so it's all written down in a book. Well, I believe that the book uh, talking about the Old Testament was probably written by the Catholic monks and the Knights Templars, the Knights of Masonic Order of Templars in the uh, Catholic Church going back to the 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th century and 12th century. And that today what we call Judaism was invented probably about 150 to 200 years ago. It was not, there was no such a thing as ancient Jerusalem and ancient Jews and ancient people. But there is a religion that says it goes back to thousands of years. But I think that that is just a, uh, a, a book. It's just written in the book. Now you gotta find out who wrote the book. 
and and why is it that all of the so-called prophecies of the Old Testament were fulfilled in the New Testament? So looking at this some 30 and 40 years ago, 50 years ago, I was talking to rabbis, Jesuit scholars, teachers, theologians. I've been doing this kind of reading for many, many years, back in 1959 to 60s when I started. So we're talking about almost 58 years or 59 years ago. And in all the discussions I've had around the world with all the writers and researchers and authors and lecturers and teachers, uh, these are the ideas that I've finally come up with at, at, the, at the age of uh, 78 years old. I'm finally totally convinced that the whole of religion is a totally misunderstood uh, our idea in the human mind. We, uh, I don't care what religion you belong to, there's more to the story than meets the eye. Um, and there's so much, and I'm giving you this pretty much off the top of my head. I didn't have time to sit down and, and write uh, notes about things I wanted to remember. So I'm just struggling to try and remember and keep it as, uh, uh, and, and, you know, keep it flowing in a, in a in a line. Now, the reason why I say I am totally sure for myself that Judaism was uh, developed as a religion by the Knights Templar Masonic Order, probably in, as I said, the late 8th, 9th, 10th, and 11th, and maybe even the 12th century uh, AD, because the Vatican. Uh, in, in its worship of the, and that's another story. <laughs> the God of the Vatican is not Jesus. It's not Yahweh of Jehovah of the Hebrews. The God of the Vatican, if you want to write this down and go do some research on it yourself and see if I'm right, go do some research on the God of the Vatican. The Catholic, uh, the very Catholic Church is based on the worship of a god named Dagon. D-A-G-O-N. Very simple. D-A-G-O-N. Dagon. Dagon was an ancient Phoenician Canaanite god. You've heard of the land of Cana? Today we call the land of Cana Israel. <clears throat> when you go back to, and there's so many facets to this, but... Um, Let's let's look at the let's look at this one thing first. The land of Cana and Dagon. The Dagon is a Phoenician Canaanite god. The Phoenicians and Canaanites uh, worship today. The whole world of Catholicism worships the old Canaanite uh, fish god called Dagon. Dagon was also called Anis. Spell O N Anis Anis or Dagon. In any either one you look up, it will tell you the whole story of where this uh, this ancient god Dagon came from. It's supposedly he came out of the sea, uh, and in the in the Middle Eastern stories that come out in the ancient world, Dagon came out of the sea. He was a god who lived in the ocean. And he came out and taught the humans uh, how to plant food and how to run a government and all the other things he showed us how to do. And then he went back into the ocean. And every now and then he'll come out and has some new ideas to give us. And so today the Pope wears the hat of Dagon. He worships Dagon. And so he's leading the entire world. The papacy leads the entire world of so-called Christianity not Christianity at all. It's Dagon worship. And so the Pope is leading the whole world in the worship of Dagon, the fish god. And this is why today there are so many Christians around the world, both Catholic and Protestant, so many Christians and so many Jews around the world, believers and non-believers, all the people around the world, including Islam, are praying for peace. They're praying for a better life. They're praying for protection. So we're always talking about, uh, we're praying to God for this or that. Well, so many people in Christianity, Judaism, and Islam are praying for something. They're praying for hope and praying for protection. And the more they pray, the worse we go, the worse we get. 
the more corruption we're getting, the deeper we're getting into debt. The, we are we're waking up to find out that our whole entire world is is crumbling in front of us, and there's a whole dungeon of demonic uh, depravity coming for the world, called the New World Order, with uh, people being thrown into prison. Your rights and privileges and your rights and protections are all gone in America. Uh, you know, America is, is, in, is, is in a horrible place. And, uh, you know, it, it, she's lost everything. She's lost, her, she's lost her jobs. She's lost her property. She's lost her freedoms. She's lost her rights and her protections. America has lost its, its, its uh, financial support. America just lost everything. Period. They've lost it all. And now the only thing left to lose now is their minds. So now Americans are losing their minds. Now they're going into shops and restaurants and blowing up buildings and shooting people. And every day there's a shooting and a murder. Something's going on every day. It just shows that the whole of Western civilization is breaking down. It's falling apart. Why? Because they have built uh, their their worship on things which they did not understand and they're ultimately going to wake up and find out that the entire world of Christianity Judaism and Islam are all based on the worship of demonic depravity gods of the ancient world and we never realized what was going on we never knew we just were born and raised into a system and accepted it and nobody ever read anything nobody questioned anything so now we're finally paying the price. What goes around comes around. Now our our great civilization that we, we thought we were promoting around the world is falling apart. Why? Because it's not real. It's based on ancient pagantry, based on ancient occult sciences that we have no knowledge of at all. So, I mean, when you go back into the history, and the reason why, and I forgot to bring this out, the reason why I believe that Judaism was dreamt up as a religion in the A.D., uh, the early A.D., 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th century uh, A.D., and was not a B.C. religion at all, is because we know that, that, <laughs> that all of these stories coming out of the ancient uh, B.C., supposedly B.C. religions of the world, uh, we're not true. We now know that. I mean, it's, it's all over Israel today. Scientists and philosophers and archaeologists and paleontologists are saying there was no ancient Israel. Never existed. I mean, some of the most, some of the best minds uh, in the academic field that Israel today has are writing books. Many books. Many people are speaking out. Many professors and teachers are saying that there was no ancient Israel, period. There never existed. There was no King Solomon. There was no King David. One of the earliest uh, Bibles I had, and I can't remember what it was because I've, you know, I've had to move so many times and I've lost it, but there was an old Bible I had that everywhere uh, in the Old Testament uh, that I would call the Old Testament, Everywhere that the word King David would appear, it didn't say King David in that particular old translation. It would say King Druid, not D-A-V-I-D, but D-R-U-I-D, King Druid, not King David. And so I began to look at the connection between the Druids and and the Jewish religion, and then I come to understand, very simple if you just look at it, the Jewish religion is the Druid religion. Druidism is Judaism. Period. All of the all of the ancient uh, dressing, the, the the priest, the high priest, uh, the, the 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 clothes that the high priest wore, the words, the terms their temples, the way they set up their religion in the ancient uh and the and so called ancient uh Druid religion is everything is Judaism. 
It's all Jewish, so-called Jewish religion today. It's actually a Druid religion. And what were the Druids? Well, the Druids were, before the Roman Empire even existed, in Europe, before the Roman Empire even existed, there was already millions of people living in Europe. And, and the Roman Empire hadn't even started yet. And so there were already a lot of uh, people living in that area covered by the Roman Empire. And they were covered, uh, and, it, and it took in north, east, west, and southern Europe. So the Druids were a people which we call the Europeans, or today is called Caucasians or the white man. And uh, so the white man or the Europeans or the Caucasians were Druids. And so this was a religion before the Roman Empire. And so uh, one of the most important symbols in the Druid uh, world of, uh, of life in Europe, and of course the Druids ran all of north, east, west, and southern Europe, which is incidentally where we get the word news, N-E-W-S, is north, east, west, south, N-E-W-S, news comes from the the four corners of a continent. So uh, so the Druids were a very powerful presence in Europe. So if you were a doctor, a lawyer, or a politician, or a teacher, or anybody who had important positions in society, you were a Druid if you were in Europe. European, white man, Druid. And so you were, and so the Druids were a very powerful priesthood. Now, one of the most important symbols in the Druid religion in Europe was a magic wand, like Merlin the magician, uh, and and today we even have the orchestra leaders uh, who wave their magic wand when conducting an orchestra. Uh, the the waving of the magic wand or Merlin the Magician from England. So magic wands were always made out of the wood of a holly tree. It's made out of hollywood. And once you understand that Hollywood is nothing more than a so-called Jewish establishment, no, Druid establishment. And then you find out that there's a very big important connection between the Druids and the Germanic people. The German peoples, they gave us all kinds of Druid religious uh, belief systems and, and, you know, Christmas and the holly tree. Uh, all of this is a European Druid system of life and government. And today I am telling you, you may find this very difficult to believe, but if you do your homework, you will find out I'm right. And I've talked with many, many scholars in the field who are far better than I. And they, they have all agreed that I am correct in my assumption. Uh, you will find that what we call the German people today, Germany and the German people, the German presence in Europe, is the same as the Jewish presence in Europe. In my book, the Jewish and Germans are one and the same thing. The Jews are the Germans. Or the Germans are the Jews. Mm -hmm. And so there's a dark, dark connection that most people have never even thought of that, that connects the Jewish idea, the Jewish philosophies in the world, the Jewish religion with the Germans. And the Germans and Jews share a lot of things that you never even thought about. And well, so, let me just interject here real quick, because they, they yep. do call it magic in Hollywood, right? It's Hollywood magic. It's kind of right there in your face what it is. Uh, so this makes a lot of sense when you think about the common vernacular. But one thing that uh, you, you passed over a couple of times, and, and uh, the basis for these religions at this point coming from something that seems to have been authored by the Knights Templar in one way or another, um, I think it is uh, appropriate to describe 
what uh, the Knights Templar actually were, because many a theory and many an examination has gone around regarding this. Uh, and I've got to tell you, a lot of it is very misinformed. A lot of it is very misleading. Uh, you know, even the fact that today there is an organization that still calls itself the Knights Templar. Uh, which is yep. under the Masonic orders, uh, just like, you know, the, the Freemasons and these other secret societies. It still exists. And yes, they have their, you know, uh, uh, ostensibly their public face where they do charitable deeds and things like that. Um, <clears throat> but I happen to know that that organization still exists. And, uh, but, but people misunderstand, I do believe, the, uh, the history of it and how it is that, uh, what 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 were they called technically speaking uh the the holy knights of the poor man or something like this uh yeah. allegedly how is it that they would come to do this and you know precisely what are the knights templar well i think that uh the knights templar as you say is true it's a very big subject and it's been uh been used as the basis for the indiana jones uh, movies, the uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, and uh, and the the Last Crusade, and they talk a lot about the secret societies of Freemasonry in Europe and all that kind of thing. So it's a very big subject. But the reason I'm saying that I believe that the uh, that the Church, the Vatican, came up with the idea of Judaism. I think it it came up with this idea and promoted it. Why? Simple. The Vatican is now presenting itself to the world to be the solid focal point of world Christianity representing the Almighty God on the earth. But in order to do that over the centuries, going back into the uh, really history of Europe, going back into the you know first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth century of Europe, they needed, the church required and needed to have a legitimate foundation. If you're going to build something, you've got to have a good foundation. You build on concrete. You build on something that's sturdy. You don't build on sand. And so the church was building on sand. It has no official connection to God at all. It has no official connection to anything at all. It's just an ancient cult worshiping Dagon, the fish god, and the Phoenician Canaanite god of Anis. And so this whole ancient uh, uh, mess that we refer to as the Vatican and the Catholic Church today around the world, it needed a legitimate, de jure, and real foundations on which to base the church's existence today. So if the church were to come into existence and just out of the out of the ordinary, just popped him one day and said, we represent the almighty God, and that's the way it is for the whole world. Well, there's too many people would would immediately reject that. You just you just popped into town overnight, and now you're going to be the, the one who actually represents the almighty God. On what do you base <clears throat> that incredible assumption that you were represent God. So they have to, the church had to come, uh, they had to come with a, with a story based on an ancient civilization that was ancient, uh, you know, thousands of years ago. And so it's not just the Catholic churches today is the ultimate authority on the earth representing God. No, no, they, they base their position on the ancient world. And going back into the ancient world of the ancient Hebrews and the ancient God of the Hebrews and, 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 and all of the holiness of ancient Israel and all of that stuff, which is all, all, which is nothing more than creating a story. Just like you could create a story about your family and talk about all the wonderful things they did and how they set up governments and they were this and they were that. And that's why you should be considered today you know to be so holy and righteous because of your family then we come to find out no your family was just like everybody else's family they didn't do any of the stuff you said but if you can but you know if you can control the news media 
and radio and television and the printed page during the Middle Ages, you could propagandize the whole world into believing that the Catholic Church sits on the ancient foundations of the Jewish revelation, the Jewish people, God's chosen people, and the holiness of Israel and all of that nonsense is nothing but propaganda that never existed. And today, like I said, there are there are paleontologists, archaeologists, and scientists, and teachers all over Israel itself are writing books about how there never was an ancient Israel. The whole thing was a was a story. There was no King David. There was no King Solomon. There was no temple. There was none of it. It's all just a story to give the Catholic Church and the Christianity uh, a, a, a solid foundation upon which to say we are the, the, the we are the carriers of the great legacy of the ancient Hebrews and the ancient God of the Jews. They were God's chosen people, and today we are the Christian fulfillment of all of that today. When actually, no, the entire superstructure of Western civilization is a religio, political, financial, uh, military empire that has no basis with God or anything decent or anything holy. It's just basically sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It's a military industrial complex. And then when you begin to see how the you know when watching movies like Godfather and got the third one in the series Godfather three, where the mafia is actually in the Vatican dealing directly with the so called Holy Father, and then you begin to see the connections with the Lucosa Nostra and the all the secret societies and criminal societies in the world coming out of Rome, coming out of Italy, and then you begin in, get into the dark secret societies of Italian Freemasonry. It is one hell of a dark, evil story. And then the first two world wars in Europe. And so something is going on here and it hasn't got anything to do with Jesus or anything holy. This is a, this is a well laid plan for thousands of years to fool the entire world into believing that the church today, the Catholic church, is sitting on the records and all the ancient wonderful the history of the Jewish people. When in point of fact, there was no ancient Jewish people. The whole thing is a story. And that's why it's falling apart today, because that's the way things work. Eventually, it's all going to fall apart, and the Vatican will have to change with the times. And that's another thing we could talk about, the different symbols in the Catholic Church. Where did they come from? And uh, and the words and the terms and the history, all of this is, is shadowed in darkness, and we're not being told any of this. So as far as I'm concerned, the Vatican represents the worship of an ancient pagan deity from Phoenicia, Canaanite uh, deity, and it's, and it's just an incredible story of betrayal and lies and deception. All you gotta do is have an honor. You know, you gotta, you gotta not only be able to look like the Bible has Jesus saying, you know, you look with your eyes, but you don't see. You listen with your ears, but you don't hear. And with your heart, you don't get the sense of it. And that's exactly right. The people of this world, they look with their eyes, but they don't see what the Vatican really is what the Catholic Church really is. They don't see the history. They don't see it. Why? Because they don't want to see it. They're not interested to see it. And so they're making a lot of money uh, you know, being a part of the establishment. So everybody just goes along to get along. I've seen that all my life, people going along to get along with their organizations. Uh, why? Because it's their money. They're... they're, they're their livelihood depends on what they don't see. So they purposely don't see it. For me, I don't care. I do see it. And I would like to talk about it. I'd like for people to understand the Vatican does not represent Jesus. Jesus is Iusus in Greek, and it goes back to sun worship. All of this so-called Judaism, Christianity, and Islam can be traced back to the worship of the sun. And of course, there's a they mixed in over the period of centuries was uh, the worship of the moon god, Sin. 
or Sinai. Uh, the worship of the planet Saturn is very big in the Middle East and in the world today, all over the world. The Germans are big on the on the Brotherhood of Saturn. And, and in Germany, there were Jewish organizations that were promoting the worship of the planet Saturn. Saturn was called El. This is why he today, you know, boy, when you get into Saturn worship and connecting it with the ancient Jewish worship, you begin to see the connections between Germany and the Jewish religion and the German people. And uh, and this is why the, the Jews today are still worshiping the old sun god but by a different name today. And that sun god has now become, as, as life would have it, it's now evolved into moon worship because Allah of the uh, Islamic world, Allah was originally a sun god. And he is still pictured in, in pictures coming out of the Islamic world today shows the Arabs all lined up worshiping with their hands in the air the rising sun. And so, but Allah now today is understood by the academics of the world, people who study the religion of Islam know that Allah is the same moon god, going all the way back to the moon worshippers. And that brings in the, you know, the, the moon worshippers we call the, uh, you know, the, the Jewish people. There were no Jewish people. They were Phoenician Canaanites. They worshipped the moon. And, and and the moon god today is Allah. Allah is a moon god. But Allah and Yahweh, Yahweh for the Hebrews and Allah for the Arabic, were both sun gods originally. And that's why you, you know, and that's why today the, the 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 foundation of Judaism and Christianity and Islam, but especially Judaism and Christianity, is the sun worship. Of the ancient sun god in uh, in in Egypt, and this is why the ancient Egyptians said you can't see God. Nobody can see God, but you can see his offspring, his son, S U N. And I have been criticized uh, many times, been criticized by people who say that I am mixing up the word S O N with S U N, the sun god, S U N. And so Jesus is referred to as God's Son, S-O-N. And Jesus is God's Son, the light of the world. Of course the S-U-N is the light of the world. What else lights the world if not the sun? And Jesus is God's Son because he is our risen Savior. Of course it's a risen Savior. The sun, uh, every morning, 5.30, it rises. And it is your Savior. You don't think so? If it goes out, we're dead in three weeks. The sun is the life of this universe. The sun is the life of our solar system. Without the sun, we're frozen and we're dead and gone. Right. So Jesus is God's son, the light of the world. Yes, the sun is the light of the world. And he is our risen Savior? Yes. And he had 12 helpers or 12 apostles? That's right, 12 signs of the zodiac. And he walks across the sky in 12 steps. And so in the ancient Egyptian religion, the sun was a, was a sun god, uh, and the Jews today still worship the sun god of Egypt. That's their main god. Everywhere on the earth that you go to any synagogue, this is, this is true on any continent and any place on the earth you go, if there's a synagogue, go in the synagogue and you will see the the name of the Jewish God is in four letters, and they uh, because the the name of God is so holy that in Judaism you cannot use his name. God's name is so holy, so they have in Judaism they have given you four letters, uh, which represent the Jewish God, the God of the universe, God's chosen people, and and the God of the chosen people is is uh, Yahweh, Y-H-W-H. And so his name is so holy, though, that you cannot pronounce it. So they, the Jewish religion has given the four letters that represent uh, the God of the Hebrews. So you don't have to use his name. And so those four letters 
are referred to, and ask any Jew, go to any encyclopedia and look it up, the four letters for the Hebrew God, which is the sun god of Egypt, uh, the four letters for the Hebrew God is called Tetragrammaton. The Tetragrammaton are the four Hebrew letters for the abbreviation of the of the God of the Hebrews. Tetragrammaton. It's tetra, meaning four. Gramma, meaning letter. Letters, like A, B, C, is a gramma. So tetra, four, gramma, letters. Aton, A-T-O-N. Tetragramma Aton, A-T-O-N, is the god Aton in Egypt. Look up the word A-T-O-N and then look at the last four letters in the Tetragramma Aton. And then you will see always, every single time you will see those four letters representing the god's name of the Hebrews, it will always be inside a circle of the sun. Every synagogue, every place you will go, uh, just put it into, go on the web and just type in Tetragrammaton and see and go to image and you will see all over the earth the Jews always put the name of their God, that abbreviation name, Tetragramma Aton, and it will always be inside of a sunburst. A sunburst. Why? Because the sun verse is representing the Aton or the sun god of Egypt and then when you understand the connection between the Jewish people with their tetragramma Aton worship of the sun god uh, and, and then connecting that to the German people as I said before and what was the what was the most important symbol in the Germanic world it was the, the picture of the sun and then uh, Adolf Hitler used the sun also, the Aton symbol, and he called it the swastika. Well, if you don't realize this, you may not know this, but in Israel today, if you go to Israel today, there are certain synagogues in Israel that are very old. They go back hundreds of years, but they all have on their floor a big, huge swastika on the floor of the of the uh, synagogues in Israel. So the Jews were using the Tetragramma Aton, or the symbol of the swastika, on the floors of their uh, of their sim of their synagogues. A very a very obvious connection to Adolf Hitler using the symbol of the swastika, which is a sun symbol the sun symbol of the Aton. Get it? Tetra, Grandma, Aton. The sun worship of the sun god Aton in Egypt. Go look, go look it up in a dictionary or encyclopedia and you will see both the Germans, the Germanic peoples, the Christianity of today, the Jewish people, all of these uh, in Western civilization, all over the world in the Western civilization, are worshipping the Aton, the symbol of the sun god of Egypt, the Tetragramma Aton. So wake up and understand why it is that people are praying for peace and praying for their families, and the more you pray, the worse it gets because you're worshipping pagan gods. And that's all you've been given is the pagan deities, pagan gods, the Aton from Egypt, the fish gods of Phoenicia, Cana, the Vatican, Protestant Christianity is nothing more than one of the offsprings of the corporation. The, Unite, the, the Vatican is a corporation, and so is the British government. The British government is a corporation. The United States is a privately owned company. It's a corporation. It's a municipal corporation incorporated in Delaware. It's no longer, we're no longer the United States of America. There is no United States of America. We are the United States. Go look it up in the dictionary. Do something really strange you've never done before. Go read a book, and you will find that the United States of America, the, the republic that was founded back in 1776, died and is gone. It no longer exists around the world. People 
uh, and, and politics around the world know the United States of America does not exist. There is no such, uh, there is no such place. There is a place today in North America called the United States. It's a corporation. It's a company, a privately owned company. And you need to find out who the co- the owners of the United States Corporation are. It's an incredible story. But uh, in 1871, uh, after the Civil War was over, if you think about it, the Civil War was one of the bloodiest wars mankind's ever fought. And so it was a civil war in the United States. Well, after the war was over, uh, this country was anything but united. We were here, and we're all eating, but we're not united. So the, we're no longer a united states. We've been very disunited. So one half of America is killing the other half. So we're not united states. Right, all true. So you know, Jordan, it's interesting because you said in Western religions you see the sun, but uh, quite honestly, in Eastern religions you see sun worship as well. The swastika existed, uh, according to archaeological studies. To, to in the, the Hindus and the Buddhists. Hindus and the Buddhists, plus, I mean, of what course. do we call Japan today? The land of the rising sun, is it not? That's right. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, so I, I think sun worship seems to be, uh, something that has gone around the entirety of the planet. Uh, it has. In one way absolutely. or another. Uh, it ha- absolutely has. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, another thing that you'd mentioned, and I'm sorry to interrupt again, but, you know, That's I think right. this is very relevant, is that uh, you mentioned the uh, the god El. Now, I have often heard the term Elohim, right? Yeah. And uh, I, I've heard that used by more than one individual, and I wonder if you wouldn't uh, address that. Yeah, yeah, let me do that. Let me talk about that real quick. Uh, in the, uh, first of all, in Hebrew, uh, there is no Hebrew religion. I mean, there is no Hebrew language. First of all, understand there is no such a thing as a Hebrew uh, language. Uh, there are people that we call Hebrew, and they speak a particular language. And since we call them Hebrew, and they're speaking their their own language, we call that language Hebrew. But there is no Hebrew language. That language is not Hebrew. It's Hebrew speaking it. So it's like in America. We all speak American here. No, we don't speak American. We are Americans, but we speak English. Well, the Hebrews do not speak Hebrew. They speak a Phoenician Canaanite tongue. It's called Phoenician Canaanite. And so that language, the Hebrews speak it today, and so we call it Hebrew. No, it's not Hebrew. It's a Phoenician Canaanite, and the Hebrews are speaking it. So, you know, wake up and get a, get an education. The Jews are speaking a Hebrew language. Why well, Hebrew is not Hebrew. It's a Phoenician Canaanite language. And that's why in, in the, when you connect it to Germany, uh, the German and the, and the Germanic world, the Germanic people, they are also Jewish, but they are speaking Yiddish, which is a German Phoenician Canaanite, you know, combining German with the Phoenician Canaanite or Hebrew. So once you understand that there is no such a thing as a Hebrew language, there's a Phoenician Canaanite language that the Hebrews speak. Now, if you, uh, in the Hebrew or Phoenician language, God, is E-L. L is God. Well, if you look up E-L in a religious dictionary or any dictionary, you will see that L is the name given to God in the Middle East. And L, of course, was also uh, uh, also understood to be the planet Saturn. Saturn was referred to as L, that, that beautiful planet out there with the circle around it, it's called L in the ancient Middle East. They didn't call it Saturn. And so L or Saturn uh, and the Phoenician and some of the uh, um, other languages in the Middle East, they refer to uh, L uh, as the, uh, or the planet Saturn, I should say. They refer to the planet Saturn as Shabbat. Shabbat is S-H-A-B-B-A-T-H, Shabbat. Shabbat is... Saturn. Saturn was referred to as Shabbat. 
And go get a dictionary and look up Shabbat, and it will tell you that is an old Phoenician Canaanite, so-called Hebrew word for the planet Saturn, S-H-A-B-B-A-T-H, Shabbat. So if you're going to worship the planet Saturn, then you have, you set aside a day, and it's called the Sabbath. No, not Sabbath, Shabbat. Shabbat was the god of the Sabbath. And so you have a rock group called Black Sabbath. That's exactly right. Black was the color associated with the planet Saturn. And Saturn was called the black planet, the dark place, the dark force. And this is why today judges wear black robes. Uh, you know, Darth Vader wears a black robe. Uh, you know, Dracula wears a black robe. Catholic priests wear black robes. When you graduate from university or high school, you wear a black robe. Black robes represented the planet Saturn, Shabbat. He was worshipped on the Sabbath. So remember, Christians and Jews, uh, you know, remember to keep holy the Sabbath. Sabbath is the worship of a planet, of the divine, of a, of a dark force in the universe called the, the, the planet Saturn. Well... I mean, go back and look at where this stuff comes from. And so today, the Jews are still worshiping the sun god. They still have uh, parts of the old moon god religion. They got the old lunar calendar, and they have uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of the parts to the old lunar religion, like going out your know, holy days after sundown. But today, uh, Judaism, uh, coming down through the last couple of hundred years, has now accepted as their main god the planet Saturn. Saturn is as another name for the Saturn in the Middle East was El, E L. And so today, when you go to Genesis one one, and it says in the Bible, uh, in the King James Bible and other Bible translations, it says the same thing. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But if you go to the Hebrew first, go to the old Phoenician Canaanite Hebrew Bible, Jewish Bible first, and read it there in Hebrew, you will see it doesn't say that. It doesn't say in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. That's in the English translation. Why? Because the English were very good at translating the king's English. They made a few mistakes when they get into Hebrew and, and, and Greek and Aramaic and some of the other languages. So the correct, if you go back to the old Hebrew Bible, it doesn't say in the beginning El created the heavens and the earth. But El is the word for God. But it doesn't say El. It says Elohim created the heavens and the earth. Well, Elohim is not El. Two separate words. Elohim is a plural, just as you would put an S on the end of the word car, it becomes cars, meaning more than one. And so El is God, but if you're going to talk about the many gods, then you say Elohim, because it's a plural in the Phoenician language. And so today, when you read in Genesis 1-1, it says, in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. That means to go back and read it in English correctly. And I was told this back in 1960 by a very high-ranking rabbi teacher back east who was, who was at that in 1960 was known as one of the most important rabbis in America. I used to talk with him all the time. That was 58 years ago. And he said, no, there's no place, this rabbi told me, there's no place in the Old Testament, you call the Old Testament, there is no place where it says God created man. I don't know, you know, you don't know where that idea came from about God created man. It doesn't say that in the Phoenician Canaanite language. It doesn't say that in the Old Hebrew. There is no place where it says God created man. And so I ask him, well, clarify that. He says, well, first of all, it doesn't say El created. In the beginning, El created the heavens and the earth. No, Elohim, the gods. So a correct translation, according to what we call Hebrew, will be in the beginning, the gods created the heavens and the earth.
Not right. God, the gods, more than one. And then when they were creating Adam and Eve, uh, the gods, collectively, they said, come, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And I said to the rabbi, well, doesn't that mean that the God has created man in his image and likeness? No, no, not at all. You're reading it wrong. Go back and read it correctly. What it is saying, Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, in Genesis 1, 28, when God, the gods are creating Adam and Eve, it says, come, let us, who is us? Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And I said, well, there it says that God is making man. No, it is not. Go back and read it correctly. It is, if you read it correctly, here's the way you would read it. In the beginning, God created, the gods created the heavens and the earth. Then in Genesis 1.28, when they're creating Adam and Eve, it says, the gods, more than one, the group of them, they said, come, let us make man in our image. After our likeness, not make man, man's already here. So let's make man in our image, after our likeness, which is basically saying, let's play with this, this thing we call DNA and the, and the reproduction of life on the earth. Let's cross genes and genetics with one of the female uh, Neanderthal creatures here. Some of these creatures that are roaming around on two feet, and they look like, uh, you know, they look like animals. Well, they, they live like animals. They eat each other, and they live like animals. But come, let us make man in our image, after our likeness which implied they were cross breeding with the with the creatures that we you know that were already here and they were creating a different kind of creature and so that different kind of creature was what they were creating in Genesis 128 and then later on in the uh, couple of chapters more it says uh, the the God says now now look what has happened now here we have created man in our image after our likeness and now look he's like us man has become as one of us he's fighting like we uh, like we fight he's chasing sex like we do he's eating and and killing like like we do uh, he's uh, <laughs> We we created him to be like us. Well, he's like us now, and now you're going to have to deal with him because you put too much intelligence into him. Now he's no longer just an animal. He has become as one of us, knowing good and evil, meaning he knows what he's doing. Now he's creating rockets and lasers and atomic bombs. See what you've done? You have you have crossbred into this into this uh, life form on the earth and now you've created them like us now we've got a problem we're going to have to deal with these people now because they're getting smart there's nothing they can't do if they get together they're going to be a hell of a problem to us and so the, uh, the scripture says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth no Elohim the gods and so it's just as if and so that's why today we say, or we're told, that in the Jewish religion, uh, they are the first monotheistic religion. The Jews have the first monotheistic religion. Mono meaning one. So they're the worshippers of one God. Nothing could be further from the truth. Anybody who understands the Hebrew, the, the so-called Hebrew history of the past thousand years realizes the Hebrews were anything but monotheistic. They worshipped the moon, they worshipped the stars, they worshipped Saturn, they worshipped uh, all kinds of sun, they worshipped all kinds of ancient gods. And today it's amalgamated into one big happy family. All the Jewish religion is Judaism, is nothing more than the moon worship, the sun worship, Saturn worship. They got worship of Mars, they got worship of money, women, sex drugs, rock and roll, it's a big, huge religion, but there's nothing old about it. It's a very ancient concepts and ideas. But today, mm -hmm. it's an incredible story about how much the people do not understand 
You know, Christianity, I believe, gave birth to Judaism so it could have a foundation on which to build a legitimate church. So the people of this world will buy into the idea that the, that the church and the Vatican and the Catholic Church and the Christianity in general uh, is a very legitimate and de jure and real religion based on the ancient peoples of the, of the Hebrews and the ancient Jewish people and God's chosen people and all that, never realizing for a moment the whole thing was dreamt up during the Middle Ages to give the Catholic Church and the Vatican today the, the basis for claiming that they speak for God. Well, as and we get as we get open. close to uh, the end, because we're we're only down to the last ten minutes or so, Jordan, uh, I, I wish to uh, to offer something else here. You've given us two examples where, in uh, the text itself, if read with the proper translation, in two sp- places there, these are not the only ones where there is an implication that there is not only more than one God, but more than one God named, even when God speaks in what most people refer to as the Old Testament, the references made in the language indicate that there is more than one God, that they are a God, you know, uh, I am the God of this. Well, either I am the God or, you know, if there's only one, then there would be no purpose of explaining that there are others. Uh, Well, and of course, what about the Ten Commandments? Well, the first commandment, the Ten Commandments says, I am the Lord your God. He doesn't say, I am the Lord of the universe. I'm the God of all gods. No, he says, I am the Lord, your God. This is not, uh, I'm not the God of everybody, but I'm the Lord God, your God. And I will not have strange gods before me, which is simple to understand. The young man has engaged, is engaged to the young girl, and they're going to get married. And so he is saying to the girl, uh, look at, I, I realize there are other good looking, handsome young men out there in the world, but in your case, I am the only one. So, I'm not saying that there aren't other, other handsome young men out there, but I'm telling you, for you, I am your God. I am your man. So, I, I'm jealous. I want to make sure you understand that. I don't want to see you messing around with other young men. Well, that's what God is saying. I am the Lord, your God. And I don't want to see you uh, messing around with any other God. Of course, hell, there are plenty, there are plenty of gods. There's, there's a whole mess of them. But I am the Lord God, your God, and I don't want to see you messing around with any of the other gods. And so, therefore, it's right there. Is that, you know, this is why we say the, the Jews were worshippers of one God. Well, let me explain that. If there were 15 gods standing in front of you, and they're all quiet, standing there at a rapt attention, and you pick the one you like, and you look at all 15 and look at their record and see who they are, and then you decide to pick one, the one you want to be your God. Okay, so you pick that one, but there are 14 others equal, but there are 14 others, but you didn't pick them. You only picked the one you like. So therefore, we can now say that you are the worshiper of one God. That's right. You're the worshiper of one God, but there's 14 other ones. And that one God said, I don't want you messing with those other 14. Arrowhead, remember that? So I am the one you picked. So leave those other 14 gods alone. I'm the one that picked, you picked me. So I am the Lord God, your God. And I'll not have any other gods before me. He didn't say there were no other gods. He said, I don't want to see you messing with any of them. That's that's the bottom line. Right. So, that, that That is, but but it's right there in the language, Jordan. It's, it's yeah, not as though, and, and it's funny because when people discuss this, Uh, That's why I brought up Elohim, because I have stated before and basically been called, you know, many different names for explaining that right there in your text. uh, If it's read properly, it tells you that uh, there are gods, plural. And, um, yep. You know, but that's, but that's not what's taught. You see, what, what's taught and what's written and what is. Now these could all be three separate things at any given moment when you take a look at this subject, right? Of course, yeah, of course. But that's like anything else. I mean, that's just like the history of your country. I mean, we've been told all kinds of things that are not true. 
As a matter of fact, if you really get into it like I have for 60 years, you'll find basically nothing on the earth that you've ever believed is true. Period. Across the board. It's all lies. It's all, it's all been put together a, a thousand years ago in Europe that you didn't know anything about. You don't know anything about what's going on in the Vatican behind the scenes of 500 years ago. You don't know anything about 800 years ago. In the Vatican, you have no idea what's been going on politically or sociologically in the Vatican or in Europe, around the world. You don't know anything about what's going on. So the bottom line is, is that this is a, an old, old story, and it's just now beginning. I think it's an idea whose time has come to begin to tell the people the truth about where the church comes from, where religions come from. And that there's nothing holy in the Holy Land, and that's why there's nothing but bloodshed and violence all over the Holy Land, because it's a, it's a place of violence and, and lies and deception, political, money, Rothschilds, banking, international banking, the, the, you know, the, it's just an incredible display of ignorance and ill-informed stupidity because we are worshiping old ancient gods. We need to wake up and find out that the entire world is lying in the power of the wicked one. That's what the scripture said. The whole world is lying in the power of the devil. Well, you, you take the word, uh, you take a D as in David. You take the letter D and put it in front of the word evil and it becomes devil. And you take one of the O's out of the word good and it becomes God. God is good and the devil is evil. You begin to see how the whole world has been led. And see, we were born as little babies, and we grew up never realizing that the adults around you were little babies and that they grew up into big babies. And so they just go along with with, what they were taught, and other people go along with what they were taught, and the whole world goes along with whatever their culture has taught them. So that today, nobody knows beans about nothing. Nobody understands Nobody realizes we've all on the face of the earth been lied to, deceived, and you haven't even scraped the surface. We've got a lot more to talk about in things, you know, times to come. Well, absolutely, and I do believe the time has absolutely come for this conversation, but unfortunately this will be uh, just about the end of the first part of this series and uh i urge you you the listener to go to jordan maxwell show.com that's jordan maxwell show.com because that is the only website that is jordan maxwell's uh and that's all there is to say about that (laughs) okay bottom line jordan maxwell show.com is where you go um now obviously this isn't uh all about promoting Jordan's work necessarily tonight because this is a special presentation and uh, we did uh, keep a very narrow focus. I'm uh, grateful to see in the chat room that uh, uh, a chatter states that this is uh, one of the most blasphemous pieces of banter they have ever heard. Uh, I want to say thank you. And... um, (laughs) <laughs> Jordan, you know, uh, uh, blasphemy against that which is blasphemous almost sounds yeah. like double think, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, the truth is always, you know, uh, I think the the, uh, the great Egyptologist, uh, Gerald Massey, said it best. He said they, meaning the religious people, they, they are going to find it difficult when they find out they have accepted the the authority as truth rather than the truth as the authority. And people do not like uh, being told that they are wrong. You know, children in school don't like having to stand in front of the class and find out you didn't do your homework and everyone's laughing at you because you don't know the answer and you don't know this or that because you were ignorant and ill-informed and you didn't do your homework. Well, that's the same way Christians and Jews today feel. They don't like uh, learning for the first time what they've accepted as truth is now being shown that's not the truth. Now they have to deal with it, and it's going to obviously mean that they have not done their homework, and now they're unhappy that you are now, uh, you know, bringing a light. I mean, uh, that's all there is to it. If you were sound asleep and somebody came in your bedroom and woke you up, and now you've got to deal with it. 
and they don't like that. that. You know, you turn away from the light. Anybody flips the light on and you turn your head, you don't want to see it. You don't want to, you don't want to be awake. You want to go back to sleep and be happy. Well, I'm not happy. I want to know the truth. And right. like the movie said, you can't handle the truth. So <laughs> I know there's a lot of people in this world can't handle the truth. Me, I learned to handle it a long time ago. Right. And so. the thing is, you know, I'm very sure we're going to get some negative feedback from this. But here, here is the trouble. Uh, when you're in a very, very deep sleep for a long time, nobody enjoys being awakened. However, sometimes it is necessary to be woke up when there are many the things ship is, to do. The ship is sinking, yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> if it's an emergency, which I do believe we have reached that point as a yep. species, that this is an emergency, this is a time to wake up because it is time to take measures, and it is exactly the appropriate time to rip the veil away, so to speak, yep. not just peek behind it, but rip it away and take a look at what's actually happening uh, yep. uh, to this this family you know, of going, human if, beings. Go if ahead. you're going to church, you are referred to as a believer. How long have you been a believer? Are you a believer? I'm not a believer. I want to know. So I don't 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 expect me to be a believer. I go to the library and get a reference book and read the encyclopedias and read the history of the churches and finally you'll see what I saw and what everybody else sees if you bother to look. Well that's it. If you bother to look, and I know you have if you've been listening to this show again, this is only part one of a special series of presentations from Jordan Maxwell. 